Good evening and welcome to the Cobham Theatre. A very, very warm welcome to this, the 2024 Fourth Form House Drama Competition. Um, when I started my career, I absolutely hated the idea of competitive drama. I thought it was absolutely awful. And then, about 20 years ago, I was asked to adjudicate the school. And then more and more, so thought, this is one of the best things. And tonight, M you know, really brings all that together because out of, I think, 75 performers, 60 of them have never been on stage before. Um, so you're seeing lots of really fresh, raw talent. It's wonderful to see so many, uh, so many new young performers on this stage. It's great uh, that we've got 16 uh, senior directors who are realising that actually it's quite tricky to direct. <laughs> Just keeping tabs on where your cast are. So congratulations to you. I would like to say uh, a huge thanks, as always, to Mrs Whitfield for finding 75 costumes in the past seven days. Um, they look fantastic. To um, my two extraordinary theatre technicians, uh, Mr Poxon and Mr Jude, um, which is why it looks so great. And of course, we have two wonderful uh, girls operating, Bernice Say and Roxanne Tuman, who I think more or less live in the tech box at the moment. They're doing a fantastic job. Uh, it's great to see so many people here. It's going to be really packed after the interval. Could I please um, just offer a round of applause for our splendid <coughs> adjudicator? This is not uh, was, uh, is an old Bronze Grovian. Um, in my first year in 2016 when I started, we started uh, house drama uh, here. I think it had taken place, but not for about the previous 12, 15 years. Uh, and Miles actually won the first Best Actor Cup for the senior house drama. Fourth form house drama started about 18 months after that. Um, uh, when Miles went to university, uh, I can't remember exactly what you studied, but I know you did direct about 14 plays and then became president of the Drama Society of Liverpool, particularly doing a very difficult time during COVID and managed to keep things going the whole time. Um, I've seen lots of his productions online, which are fantastic, and uh, it says on your programme that he's an emerging theatre director. He certainly is. We're keeping our fingers crossed that he's about to start at your Holloway on the MA, prestigious MA director's course. Um, working with loads of professional directors and actors, um, and he should find out within the next 12 hours, but I mustn't talk about any more. <laughs> so we look forward to your adjudication later, thank you very much. Have a good look at your programme, you've got about 10 seconds left, because as soon as the lights go down, they ain't going up again until the interval, which will be at about 20 past 8. Have a wonderful hour and 20 minutes, you lucky, lucky people, and we'll see you after the interval. Thank you very much. Indeed. in the small town, starless and Bible black. The cobble street silence and the hunched quarters of rabbits were limping and visible down the slow back, slow, black, crow black, fishing boats, bobbing sea. The houses are blind as moles, the moles he find tonight in the snouting velvet dingles, or blind as Captain Cat, there in muffled middle by the pump or the town clock, the shops in mourning, the welfare hall in Widow's Weeds, and all the people of the lone and dumbfound town are sleeping now. Hush, the babies are sleeping, the farmers, the fishers, the tradesmen and pensioners. Young girls lie bedded soft, or glide in their dreams with wings of trousseau. Brights mated by glowworms down the aisle of the organ playing wood. The boys dream of the bucking branches and the Jolly Roger sea. And the anthracite statues of horses sleep 
and the cows in the bars, and the dogs in the wet-nosed yards, and the cats nap in the slank corners, or lope and sly, streaking and needling on one roof of clouds. You can hear the dew falling and the hushed down breathing. Only your eyes are unclosed to see the black and folded town, fast and slow, asleep. You alone can hear the invisible starfall, the stir of the black, dab-filled sea, where the curl you and the skylark, Zanzibar, Rhiannon, and the star of Wales tilt and rise. Listen, it is the grass growing on Clarigeve Hill, dewful, starfall, and the sleep of birds in milkwoods. Listen, it is night in the chill, squat chapel, Hemming in bonnet and brooch and bombazine black, forty winky hallelujah. Look, it is night, dumbly, royally winding through coronation cherry trees, going through the graveyard of Bethesda with winds gloved and folded, <coughs> and dew doffed, tumbling by sailors' arms. Time passes. Listen. Time passes. Come closer now. Only you can hear the houses sleeping in the streets. In the slow, salt, deep and silent black bandaged night. Only you can see in the blinded bedrooms the combs and the petticoats over the chairs, the basins and jars, the glasses of tea, and the yellowing dicky birds watching over pictures of the dead. <coughs> Only you can hear and see behind the eyes of the sleepers the movements and countries and colours and dismays and rainbows and tunes and wishes and flights and fool and despairs and the big sea of their dreams. From where you are you can hear their dreams. Captain Cap, the retired blind sea captain, asleep in his bunk in the seashelled shipping bottle, <coughs> ship-shaped best cabin of schooner house, green zone. Never such seas as any that swamp the decks with SS <coughs> Kidwelly, bellying over the bedclothes and jellyfish slippery, sucking you down salt deep into Davy Dark, where the fish come biting out and nibble him down to his wishbone and the long drown nuzzle up to him. Remember me, Captain! You're dancing, Williams. I lost my step in Nantucket. Do you see me, Captain? The white bone talking. I'm Tom Fred, the donkey man. We shared the same girl once. Her name was Mrs. Crowbats. Rosie Crowbats, 33 Duck Lane. Come on up, boys. I'm dead. Holy <laughs> Captain, I'm Jonah Jarvis. Come to that end. Fairly enjoyable. Alfred Pomeroy Jones, sea lawyer, born in Mumbles, sung like a linnet, crowned you with a flagon, tattooed with mermaids, thirst like a treasure, died of blisters. That skull at your ear hole is. Curly Bevan, <coughs> tell my auntie it was me upon the Omulu clock. Aye, aye, Curly. Tell my missus, no, I never. I never done what she said, I never. Yes, they did. <laughs> and who will bring coconuts and shores and parrots to my Gwen? How's it above? Is there milk and lard bread? Bosoms and robins. Concertinas. Ebenezer's bells. Fighting and onions. Marrows and daisies. Tiddlers and a jam jar. Butter milk and whippets. Rockabye, baby. Washing on the line. Milk goes in the snow. Owls and tennis and all Who milks the cows in my Gwen? When she smiles, it's her dimples. What's that smell of parsley? Oh, my dead dears.
success. What happened, Jake? Come on, Jake. Um, yeah? Jake. Come on, yeah? This princess, she lived in a castle. Well, I suppose all princesses live in castles, don't they? You wouldn't be seen without one. Um, no way! And this princess, she lived in a castle with her father. Uh, the king, right? <laughs> exactly, Natasha. Thank you for reminding me. The princess lived in a castle with her father, who was indeed the king. Bloody riveting this. Now, don't tell me her mother was indeed the queen. No, 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 no. The princess didn't have a mother. She died. At childbirth. Oh, boring. Come on, Buzz, let's down there. She's not even telling it. for a very long time. Well, the king should have been prepared then. Well, yes, he was, usually. The king was a great soldier. So how come the enemy surprised him? The baby princess. The castle was celebrating, right? <laughs> exactly right, Carol. It was a day for celebrating the birth of the baby princess. A holiday for everyone. The castle was full of food and music and flowers. A good old boozle. Peanuts and sausage on sticks. Everybody was dusting their funky stuff. And that's when the enemy attacked. Where the castle was slaughtered. Hey! No, 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 no. The king was too good a soldier too good. for that. Yeah, too good. In oh. fact, he defeated the enemy that day. What, the queen? Yeah, what happened to her? Um, yeah, come on, she, yeah. She, she, come was, on. she was, she was, she was, she was shot. In the heart with a, a single, single arrow. One, 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 and one, then one arrow. her head was chopped off. And then her head was eaten by a hungry pig. Wicked! Oh, no. oh, I think I'm going to be sick. After that, the king never lets the fancy down again. Am I getting this right, Jake? The king banned pleasure from the castle. What? No telly? Wouldn't be telly in those days. And what she had to eat? Plain bread. Oh, like oh, no yes, butter? Yes. No. What about margarine? No. What about jam? Shut, Shut up, Breeze. Sorry. <laughs> no, nothing. The king forbade it. And then, one night. Yeah? What? What? Uh, what? A, a, a thump? Um, yes, that's it. I remember now. The princess heard something thump against her window. What? A, a bird. Is it dead? It's legs broken. Oh, let's see. Let's, let's see. see. There's something inside the bird. What now, Jake? What, Jake? A flower seed? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> it's dead. <laughs> yes, Carol. In the secret corner of the castle. Mm, why do girls bury things instead of cutting them up? Just give me a second, Oh, guys. come on. Hurry up. Yeah. Hurry up. Come on. Come on. Hurry up. Of course. <laughs> bird is buried and then the seed grows and next summer look I'm gonna wear it in my hair oh how do you do that <laughs> don't let the king see too late yellow yeah, light and then the um the princess said I'm sorry dad please it's just a flabby <laughs> ah! what happened he's he's hit me you're banished <laughs> she leaves the castle and she walks and she walks and then yes I find a forest she plants her flowers um, and it's full of, it's full of um, seeds. And one year later, hundreds of flowers. The following, thousands. The next, don't tell me, millions. Millions of yellow flowers. Look at them, so beautiful. And look, what's that? <laughs> the lake. Where? Dolphins yeah. splashing and playing together. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. One day, a prince arrives. Me. Wait, no, me. <laughs> the prince is the most handsome man in all the land. Shut <laughs> up, Bree! Everybody knows it's me. I said it first. Wait, no, I did. Just did you too. What? The prince rode a golden chariot. You must be bloody joking, said the prince, <laughs> as he was so confident and handsome. But he also knew riding in a solid gold chariot was an honour, an honour given to true heroes. Where's my bloody horses then? <laughs> no, no, no way. Horse, <laughs> gee up, Lightning. Gee up, Ned. Wait, who's Ned? You? Oh, 
If he's lightning, I ain't gonna be called Ned. You can stuff that for Thunder! Gee up, lightning! Gee up, thunder! Come on, faster! Faster! No! That's it! I had enough! This is... No! Uh, so the horses were now exhausted, so they took a rest by a nearby lake. Is it? The princess came across these travellers. Who are you? <clears throat> lightning! She's talking to me, you pillock. Watch her, you're a horse! I'm a prince. <laughs> Do you want me to leave my forest and live with you in your castle? Go for it, Russ. I'm easy. <laughs> All right, yeah, let's do it. But, prince, my forest is so beautiful. How could I ever leave it, even for a love muscle like you? <laughs> yeah. You! You're, you're playing bloody games with me. I never liked you in the first place. We Take that one, you guys. Ernie, you're not doing anything. God damn it. Oh, who opened this? I did. What's the matter with you guys? Are you crippled or summoned? Press room. Criminal court press room. Hello, Sarge. Hold the line a minute. No, I told you it was the press room. Hello, Sarge. McHugh, anything going? What are you waiting for? How'd I know you were out? Two jobs. Ladies. Roby, four, five hundred. What do you draw it? I don't know. Hey, Ernie, why don't you take that mouth dog into the can and play? These cars are washed, right? Let's chip in for a new tip. These are good enough. I'm 80 cents out already. Is this the home of Mrs. F.D. Margulies? I like a deck with some aces in it. Jim! Now, Mrs. Margulies, this is McCure, the City News Bureau. City News Bureau. Is it true, madam, that you were the victim of a peeping Tom? Ask her if she's worth peeping at. Has she got a friend? <laughs> now that ain't the right attitude to take, madam. All we want is the facts. I mean, what did this peeping Tom look like? For instance, would you say he looked like a college professor? Tell her I can run a four now. Pass. Just a minute, madam. Is it true, <laughs> Mrs. Margulies, that you took the part of Pocahontas in the Elks pageant seven years ago? Hello? She hung up! The hell with her! It's done. Where's that boat? Rachel Ward! Clark and Harris! Too far! Harrison, 4,000. Draw! Stay! Oh, Crimes! What time is it anyway? About half past eight. One off the top. Anyways, how's the wife, Ed? Any better? Worse. That's tough. Sitting here all night, waiting for them to hang out, Williams? It's hard work, alright. <coughs> Hello, Sarge. McHugh, anything doing? Oh, that's swell. A love triangle, huh? Did he kill her? Killed them both? Ah, was she good looking? <laughs> what? Ah, oh, damn. Uh, You'll do it. 
No, never mind. Thank you, Sarge. Englewood, 6800. Ready a meal? Dr. Irving Zoba. Z for zebra. O for onion. B for baptize. E for anything. And L for lousy. Hey, what are you doing? He uh, with offices at 1608 Cottage Grove Avenue, this burg was arrested tonight on complaint of a lot of angry husbands who claimed he was treating their wives with electricity for a dollar a whack. Is the electric teaser again? He had a big following, a regular army of fat old dames that was being neglected by their husbands. So they went visiting Dr. Zobel in their kimonos to get electricity. I want to give some massages too. Anyhow, the doctor's being held for malpractice, and the station's full of his patients who claim he's innocent. From what the husband said, sounds like he's a regular Lothario. Hey, Erwin, right. why don't you go for electricity instead of playing that banjo? I'll play these. Oh, I thought so. Hello, Mrs. Schlosser. How have you been in here? Hello, Mrs. Schlosser. Have you tried the Harrison Street Station? Sometimes he sleeps in the squad room. Don't say it. What became of that rule about women coming into the press room? Yeah, I don't let my own wife come in here. Did he have any money left when you last saw him? Well, I didn't exactly see him. Did you, Mike? No, I didn't see him either. Oh, you didn't? Well, was he still drinking? I'll tell you what, I'll call it the grand jewelry room if you want. Sometimes you go to sleep up there. Don't trouble yourself. I noticed Hildy Johnson ain't here either. I suppose the two of them are out sopping it up together. Now you mustn't talk that way, Mrs. Schlosser. Hildy's reformed. He's getting married. Married? Well, all I can say is God help his wife. Come on, are we playing cards or are we? I suppose you clean Herman out. Oh, and this Mrs. Schlosser, we ain't seen him. He can't come home. I kept dinner waiting until 11 o'clock last night, and he never even called up. But why the us? Yeah, we're busy. Press room. You know where he is. You're just, you're just cleaning up for him. Is that Stephen Street there yet? No, Miss Burns. Beauty ain't shown up yet. Is that Walter Burns? Let me talk to him. Okay, Miss Burns. Herman's lost his wife. Wants to talk to you. Don't act like that loud, Miss Sweet Ain't there. Cause I can hear him. Johnson, who? Hello, Mr. Burns. This is Mrs. Slosser. You seen Hildy Johnson around anywhere? No, Mr. Burns. Oh well. How are you? Oh, I'm very well, thank you, Mr. Burns. I was just wondering if you knew where Herman was. He didn't come home last night and it was payday. Forget it. It'll be all right. But it won't be all right. I'm just going crazy. So why don't you come down early and collect the pay like everybody else? Well, I have tried that, but the cashier won't give it to me. So I was just wondering if you can give me some kind of an order. Sure. Drop in any time. Oh, will you? That's awfully good of you. Nothing at all. Goodbye. You know, I hate to do a thing like that, but you know how Herman is about money. I know, just a goddamn fuck. Well, thank you ever so much. You're all alike, every one of you. What do you do, Jack? You ought to be ashamed of yourselves. All right, we're ashamed. Sitting a around like a lot of traps, drinking, bumming, bunker. Here, give me those. What the hell? You know where he is. And I'm going to stay right here until I find well, out. Well, he's at Hogstetters. That's where he is. Now give me those cars. Where? The Turkish bath on Madison Street. In the basement. So you did know, you dirty liars. Hey! A fine bunch of gentlemen, I must say. Newspaper men. Bums! <laughs> <laughs> the second straight flush I ever had. Jeez.
Oh, Bessie, where are you? No, that's enough. That's enough, Charlie. Don't tear me to pieces. What's the trouble between you? The usual trouble. He wasn't a gentleman. Huh? They never are. These pick up acquaintances, men you meet in hotels. I wasn't expecting them to be. Then why'd you go out with them, Bessie? <sighs> oh, God, in the kingdom of heaven, I wish Why'd you, you go out with them? I can't just sit here and wait for something to happen. Polish my nails or curl my hair, wait for Christ's second coming? Is that what you would recommend for me? No, this. I'm glad of that. Vernon is. Yes, Vernon is, and that's absolutely all. I believe he would still marry you if you came to your senses. Vernon does not represent the future I plan for myself. I remember you said the same day ten years ago. Well, it's still true. There's quite a difference between the past and the future. I know that. <laughs> the past keeps getting bigger and bigger at the future's expense. We drove into Meridian and bought a copy of Billboard. It has my ad in it. Look here. At Liberty. Yes, at Liberty. Leeds, Ocean News, 27, long, attractive. Huh? Five foot two, hundred and fourteen pounds, singing, dancing, specialties. Quick study, versatile, excellent wardrobe, right wire, Gloria Le Green, Blue Mountain, Blue Mountain, Mississippi. How do you like her? It's full of misrepresentation. Oh, it is not. It is. Can't you even distinguish between the truth and a lie? You're not 27, Bessie. You're 32. <laughs> I don't look it. You do. <laughs> Nobody says I do. Why should they shout across the street to you? You want to destroy my confidence? Make me feel utterly hopeless? I've had bad times. No breaks like everyone else in show business. <coughs> but I'm not through. Do you think? Oh, so you think I am? You sit on that old threadbare sofa, night after night, waiting there for me like Mrs. Doomsday in person. Honest to go, your eyes, they're like tape measures, they keep my size for a coffin. But I'll cheat you out of it though. Bessie! Don't Bessie me! You're drunk and you're sick. Your face is burning Leave with me alone. fever. Look at your dress, how it's torn. What if it is? I don't care. Where is it? The seam is ripped out at the way. That can be mended. Yes, but other things can't. Everything can be mended. It's only a matter of time. Ah, so sublime optimism. <clears throat> you think I was born in this place? Blue Mountain, Mississippi. How do they get the mountain? As far as the board. <clears throat> oh, Christ. In Chicago, they certainly picked the right color. You're running a temperature. I practiced my dance routine this morning at Elk Social Hall. My wind's kind of bad, but otherwise, I'm okay. You can't expect a complete return of health, Bessie. Can I? No. You had hemorrhages. The tissues can heal for- Stop it! Stop it, mother! There's only one lie contained in this advertisement. At liberty. That's the lie! I'm not at liberty, mother! I'm calling the trial. So am I. But, uh, no, I'm not discouraged. It's just, it's just that I haven't had such good luck to brag about lately. Yes, and neither have I.
didn't sound good. No, not good. We should go back. What? Why? Because it didn't sound good. You can go back if you want. I'm going to see what that noise was. Because it didn't sound good. But if we're not wandering around together anymore, then I don't have a plan. What shall I do? A plan, of course. I was forgetting. Right, the plan is... You have a plan? Yes, a plan. The plan is, we go and see what that noise was. Why? Because it might have been something important. So we go, and we see, and then... And then we'll see. And then we'll work out the next bit of the plan. OK? OK. Go on. Oh my God. God. We should go. Don't be stupid. We might be able to help. I don't know if we can. I don't think we can. We might. Look, that's a very big fall. What would anyone be doing up there? What is up there? Just the old railway line. Hasn't been used for years. Not since my granddad was young. I don't think we can help. We can help. But... Well, no one else can. Hey, I'm Drew. And I'm going to stay with you and keep you safe until help gets here. What help, Drew? That's Noel. Noel is my buddy. Don't worry, you'll be all right. I don't know if that's true. Drew, what's the plan, Drew? Noel is going to call for help now. And um, who do I call? Ambulance 999. That's the plan. Ring now! Um, right, yes. OK, sure. Don't worry, we'll get you sorted and back on your feet. Just cut some bruises, that's all. You'll be all right. I don't have reception! Okay, just, just lie still. What happened to you, eh? What were you doing up there? I know you. I know your face. You went to my old school, didn't you? I got reception! Oh no. No, please, no! Jude, that's your name. Jude, that was your name. I remember. See? I made the call, I got through it, and I told them where we were, and they told me that I should keep my phone on and that we should stay here and. Look. It's too late. T too late? Too, too late. What? What's too late? Too late for what? Too late for anything. Too late for everything. Too late for Jude. <coughs> no, do you really think this is going to work? It should. I know, but I've just got a bad feeling. We've been through it so many times. But I just feel that... The what? That something might go wrong. Badly wrong. We're dealing with a killer here. This isn't a game. I never thought it was. Well, I guess it's too late to go back now. Everything and everyone is in place. Should we have told Frith? About? Oh, no. I still think it's better that Frith doesn't know. Just a few seconds left. Showtime. This is team leader blue section. Are you there, red section? We're here. Camera set? Set. Laptop set? Set. Mobile broadband access set? Set. What was the next question? Protocols overridden. Protocols overridden. Set? Set. Yes, we're in place, well hidden, and everything is working smoothly. The video camera is trained on the bridge, zoom at maximum. Focus sharp and crisp. Whatever happens up there, we'll capture it. OK, they should be there any minute. We've got movement. Repeat, we've got movement. Frith is on the bridge. Hello. He's not alone anymore. Suspect is in sight. Suspect is on the bridge. Suspect is approaching Frith. Tap down. Contact. OK, we're there. So now we call in the cavalry. Yeah, let's lift the lid on this. It's very high up here, isn't it? Yeah, great views, don't you think? Quite something, yes. You're not scared, are you? Actually, no. I'm not scared at all. Are you? Me? Very funny. Come on now, let's get down to business. What's this about? Get down to business? What an odd thing to say. Business is what I do. Clearly you wouldn't know much about that though. 
But anyway, it's not about me, it's about you. And no doubt something you either know or think you know. Oh, I know. But sometimes you can't sort things. But sorting things is what I do. I didn't get to where I am today without knowing that. And where exactly are you? Me? Look at me. I'm top of the tree. I'm king of the hill. Don't you worry about me. But I do. I do. Well, worry about the people who want to be me, but aren't. But do they know the cost? The high price of being you? What rubbish are you spouting about now? Because there is a cost, isn't there? Trust me. Trust you? <coughs> but the price. The price. Maybe you're talking about a price because you have one. A price that could make you forget everything you know. A price that's more money than you've ever seen. And all you have to do is nothing. Sometimes doing nothing is not the right thing to do. The right thing? Is there really such thing as absolute right or absolute wrong? Isn't there any what you can get away with? Can you get away with murder? Ah, uh, like I said, damn business. Miller to you, Anderson. Calm yourself. Mr. Volkov, is there anything you wish to add? Even if there is, he won't let He's right, I won't. Gentlemen, <laughs> Mr. Volkov is a lawful citizen of this nation and thus has a full legal right to speak. Thank you very much, Agent Mercer. Shut up! Where did you say you were from again? I am... Uh, Blushing, he's blushing! There's clearly <laughs> some tension between the two of you. Whether it be true hatred or true love, it doesn't matter to me. But please, let us proceed. Very well. We would like to begin with the matter of his garden. It's his garden. garden. His garden. His garden. Presented in front of you with exhibit 4C, which shows the defendant's garden and its alarming qualities. May I proceed, Your Honor? You may proceed. The following evidence has been carefully reviewed by the HUAC. The what? Oh, no! The House on American Activities <laughs> Committee. Yes. They reviewed everything we have found and condemned Mr. Volkov's garden. It's a garden. Proceed, Lawrence. Do you know what this is, Mr. Volkov? A rose? A red rose. Yes, red. You have got And this? A carnation? A carnation! <laughs> Not native here, but popular in Eastern Europe. I'll draw attention to the Hua case 245 against Mr. Kinyaza, who was recently found guilty of Soviet espionage. He admitting to owning carnations and acknowledged roses as a symbol of communist allegiance. A sign of being a red brother, as he put it. Oh, red brother, red brother! <laughs> Yo, shut it! Because in 15 years' time, we'll have your big brother watching over all of us if your kind isn't dealt with. Now, there's the matter of the raping of the flowers as well. I'll jump in, if I may. Overruled, you may not. <laughs> but I will. Underneath the cluster of carnations, we found a phone. We suspect that Mr. Volkov was involved in an illegal murder. Why'd you say illegal? Huh? Well, you said illegal murder. Are you suggesting that there's a legal murder? <laughs> Presented in front of you is Exhibit 31D, which shows the human remains we discovered three feet underground. The DNA concludes that this was a male specimen who oddly had a tail and whiskers. Oh, that is Cat. What? Cat, three months ago, I need go store. I drive car. Car hit cat, cat died. I very cat. <laughs> what? What? You mean to tell me 
It's a small bone that you test that you like you found to test positive of cat DNA. Was that actually a cat? Wow. I'll just move on. Take a look at this, Miller. Judge Miller. Notice anything odd about how it is arranged? 24 roses exactly on each side. What? Allow me. You two come over. Overall, that is it. You can't just do that. However, hear me out. I will. Now, mister. I'm Mr. or Mrs. Miss Johnson, but I'm very ready to call Mrs. Mrs. Miller. <laughs> Mwah. No. I have. $48,000 of 48 roses, and I split them equally between the two of you. That's communist, is it not? Do you have $48,000? No. Then I don't care. Equally. I will not be sharing equally. Do you gentlemen realize I work two jobs? There we go. The paltry compensation bestowed upon my refined self is an affront. Do you not realize the exquisite contributions I bring? It's a travesty, a disregard for true worth. Society must realize the grave injustice of underestimating my exceptional talents. And yet, I do not get paid enough. And you know why? Okay, you get it. Just please stop talking. It's because I'm a white woman. Oh. Oh. <clears throat> I think we better move on to the next piece of evidence, shall we? Miss Anderson? Yes. Two weeks ago, on the 7th of July of this year, the flag grants his permission to set up voice recording devices Mr. Volkov's home. And you have permits, I suppose. Yes, no, maybe it's anyways I saw. I cannot <laughs> let you continue without the permits. Overruled. But we managed to get a recording of Mr. Volkov beating a government agent for intelligence. No. no. Permission to play the card of your honor. Overruled. Anyways, I shall proceed. If we may. Was that a recording that of you singing the shower? That was a recording of you singing the shower, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Beast Boys, good taste. Anderson, where's the tape? OK, OK, so I grabbed the wrong one this morning. Big deal. Yes, it's a big deal. Oh, it's a small setback. He's lying, even to himself. Anderson, what is this? You made a fool of yourself. You have got no evidence. No proof. No validity. No regulations. No brain. What are you hiding? Nothing. Mr. Anderson. Your order. This man has been extracting government intelligence from my wife, who works for the House on American Activities Committee. Two months ago, Mr. Volkov met Mrs. Anderson. At a diner! What? Who? Where? When? Mr. Volkov! You remember I killed cat? <laughs> <laughs> I get to store, I enter, tomato soup. Where is tomato soup? I go to aisle and there, beautiful woman. Wow! Tomato soup too, but beautiful woman. I wink at her, she winks back. I move close, she moves closer. Yeah. No! So things went from good to more good. <laughs> Mr. Volkov, are you telling us that you're having an affair with Mr. Anderson's wife? Now do you understand, Miller? My wife will lash him. I'm from Krakosia. Is that Russia? No! Yes! Mr. Anderson, I have no idea how this matter has been able to go so far through this court. I've been shown red roses, red carnations. Can't you sell the lucky? Thank you. <laughs> and the bones of a dead cat. Mr. Volkov has not denied speaking to Mr. Anderson's wife. And Mr. Anderson has played me a recording of himself singing in the shower with a group of gentlemen from a, a beach, I understand. There is no evidence whatsoever that Mr. Volkov is guilty of anything other than falling for an American woman. No one's going to think anything worse than for that. You, on the other hand, Anderson, seem guilty of a number of things. But the roses, the carnations, everything. I was so sure of it all. If you wish to waste any more of this court's time, I'll have you impeached. Mr. Volkov, you are free to go. I want lunch, and this court is dismissed. <laughs>
day. Do you want any special time of day? Oh, I want the whole day. We'll begin at dawn. <gasps> Look, why, there's Main Street, and that's Mr. Morgan's drugstore before you changed it. And that's the livery stable. Yes, it's 1899. This is 14 years ago. Oh, that's the town I knew as a little girl. Oh, look, there's the old white fence that used to be around our house. Oh, I've forgotten that. Oh, I love it so. Are they inside? Yes, your mother will be coming downstairs in a second to make breakfast. Will she? And you remember, your father's been away for several days. He came back on the early morning train. No. He'd been back to his college to make a speech in Western New York at Clinton. Look, that's how he knew so. And there's our counselor. But she's dead. She died. <coughs> Whoa, Bessie. Morning, Belle. Morning, Howie. You're up early. <coughs> been rescuing a party down by Polish Town. Darn near froze to death they were. <gasps> Look, there's Joe Quarrel. Morning, Mr. Warren. Morning, Howie. Children, <laughs> Wally, Ellie, time to get up. Oh, Mama, I'm here. <laughs> oh, Mama, how young Mama looks. I never knew Mama was ever that young. You can come and dress by the kitchen fire if you like, but hurry. Good morning, Mr. Newsom. It's cold. Ten below by the barns, Mrs. Webb. Think of it. Keep yourself wrapped up. Mama, I can't find my blue hair ribbon anywhere. Just open your eyes, dear. That's all. I laid it out for you special on the dresser. If it were a snake, it will bite you. Yes, yes. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, Mr. Webb. You're up early. Yes, just been back from old college in New York State. Been any trouble here? Well, I was called this morning to rescue a Polish fella. Darn near froze to death he was. We must get it in the paper. Papa? Good morning, Mother. How did it go, Charles? Fine, I guess. I'm told a few things. Everything all right here? Yes. Can't think of anything that's happened special. I've been right cold. Yes, well, it's colder than that at Hamilton College. Students' ears are falling off. Paper have any mistakes in it? None that I noticed. Charles, did you forget? It's Emily's birthday. Do you remember to get her something? Yes, I've got something here. Where is my girl? Where is my birthday girl? Don't interrupt her now, Charles. She's slow enough as it is. Children, it's seven o'clock. Now Donald's have to call you again. I can't, I can't. They're so young and beautiful. Why did they ever have to get old? Mama, I'm here. I love you, everything. I can't look at everything hard enough. Good morning, Mama. Well now, dear, a very happy birthday to my girl and many special returns. Some surprises are waiting for you on the kitchen table. Oh, Mama, you shouldn't have. I can't, I can't. <coughs> A birthday or no birthday, I want you to chew your food good and slow. That in the blue is from your Aunt Carrie. And I reckon you can guess who brought you the postcard album. I found it on the doorstep when I walked in this morning to get the milk. George Gibbs must have come over in the cold pretty early. That's right nice of him. Oh, George, I'd forgotten that. But chew your bacon good and slow. It'll help keep you warm in a cold day. Oh, Mama. Just look at me one minute as though you really saw me. Mama, 14 years have gone. I'm dead. Mama, you're a grandmother. Mama, I married George Gibbs. Mama, Wally's dead too. His appendix burst on a camping trip in North Galway, and we felt just terrible about it. But for a moment now, we're all together. For a moment, we're happy. Let's just look at one another. This in the yellow, I found an attic among your grandma's things. You're old enough now, and I thought you'd like it. Oh, Mama, you shouldn't have. It's just what I wanted. It's beautiful. It's lovely. Well, I'm glad you liked it. I searched all over. Your Aunt Nora couldn't find one on Concord, so I had to all the way to Boston. <coughs> While he has something for you, too, he made it in manual training class. I don't know what it is myself. Your father has a surprise for you, too. Shh, here he comes. Where is my girl? Where is my birthday girl? I can't. I can't. It all goes so fast. We don't have time to look at one another. So all this was going on and we never noticed? Take me back. Back of the hill. Back to my grave. But first, 
one last look. Goodbye. Goodbye, world. Goodbye, Grover's Corners. Mama, Papa. Goodbye, clock's ticking and Mama's sunflowers and food and coffee and new iron dresses and hot baths and waking and sleeping. Oh, Earth, you're too wonderful for anybody to realize you. <coughs> Do human beings ever realize life while they live it? <laughs> every, every minute? No. The saints and poets, maybe they do some. I'm ready to go back. Earlier. Uh, Round about ten. Can we see it? About then. <laughs> I passed by you about then. Oh, yes. I noticed you were doing a bit of trade. Yeah, trade was very brisky around ten. <laughs> yeah? I noticed. <laughs> Ah oh, yes, <laughs> it was my last evening news. Went about twenty to ten. Sold your last one then, did ya? Yes, my last evening news. <laughs> Our evening news was it? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's the star is the last to go. Oh. Or the uh, what's his name? Standard. Yeah. Yes, it was the evening news that was the last to go tonight. Then that went, did it? Yeah. <laughs> like a shot. <laughs> you didn't have any left, Dad. No, not after I sold that one. <laughs> <laughs> It was after that you must have come by here then, was it? Yeah, I come by up here after that, see, after I packed up. You didn't stop by here though, did you? When? I mean, you didn't stop by here though and have a cup of tea then. About ten? Yeah. No. I went, <laughs> up, I went up to Victoria. I thought I didn't see you. I had to go up to Victoria. Yeah, tree was very brisky around ten. <laughs> I went to see if I could get hold of George. Oh? George! <laughs> yeah, George who? George. <laughs> uh, what's his name? Oh. Did you get hold of him? No, I didn't get hold of him. I couldn't locate him. He's not up to much nowadays, is he? When was the last time you saw him? Oh, I haven't seen him for years. Nor me. <laughs> he used to suffer very bad from arthritis. Arthritis? Yeah. He never suffered from arthritis. He used to suffer very bad. Not when I knew him. I think he must have left the area. <laughs> yes, it was my 
Last <coughs> evening news. <laughs> it's not always the last two goals, though, is it? No, oh no. Other times it's the news. Other times it's one of the other ones. You can never tell beforehand until you've got your last one left. <laughs> then you know which one it's going to be. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. I think you must have left the area. till the baby was half in, half out of me, and then they threw me in the grave on top of the others. The smell, I said, I'm still breathing, I said. My baby is trying to be born, but they just kept on shoveling the clay into our mouths. I was the last hat to watch the others. Your Arabs, they said. I said we're not Arabs. Thank you. Said you must be Jews, and if you're not Jews, you're gypsies. Last thing I saw was them digging up the long dead nuns, darting skeletons across the graves. Yes! God. <coughs> this endless ballad of blood and pain! The long grey arm of wind sings it down the stairs of time! Ah, Luna Shrapnel! Wheat of Saturn! Star spitting muck!
take off your earth armor. Now! A new star to wound and outshine the skies. Dying to use it on someone. Oh, tree cross. Oh, thorn. Oh, nails. Oh, nails driven from the bone until the planets rust to a million pieces. We have lived inside this knife ten million years. Prepare your skeletons or the wind. Say your landscapes in order. I will cut your shadow down. I will cross you out forever. Cross me out. My mother's blood stings in my veins. Lama Sheeta singing in my blood. With this knife. This night, two young men kill each other over a useless girl. This knife, a living thing, a snake. It finds the opening to an ancient wound that never heals. Come on, so rip me to shreds. Do you see me complaining? And no, I never found what I was looking for, but in the end, I'll find it. Love, love without ruin, love without dawn, love.
water. A, Janice. B, Gail. C, Linda. Or D, Sally. Oh, oh my, I, I haven't a Scooby. I'm going to have to ask the audience. All right, audience, it's time for you to help out the Major. Push your buttons now. He only got up to £4,000 before the klaxon sounded that night, after using two of his lifelines. To reiterate, he failed to get a single question right in rehearsal, then struggles badly as the final contestant takes the chair that Saturday night. And yet, he sailed his way to a million pounds. What on earth must have made Major Charles Ingram into a genius? We're welcoming back Mr. Major Charles Ingram into the chair. Major, do you have a new strategy? Well, I do have a strategy, yes. I was a bit defensive on the last show, talking myself out of answers that I frankly should know, and did know. So this time, I'm going on the counter-attack and show a bit more commitment. Well, let's put that to the test. For £8,000, who had... Who is the second wife of Jacqueline Kennedy? A. Abnam Khashoggi B. Ronald Reagan C. Aristotle Onassis or D. Rupert Murdoch Right, okay, I'm not certain, but I would have thought that it was Aristotle Onassis. <coughs> One of my sub-strategies is to list all the answers I could possibly have. Adnan Khashoggi, Ronald Reagan, Aristotle Onassis <coughs> and Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's Aristotle and Nassis. I'll go for that. Final answer. Are you sure? You don't have to play. Well, this new self-committed Charles Ingram is a wild and crazy man. That is... The correct answer! Even though you weren't sure... Oh. Have you ever seen anyone... And now for the all-important £32,000 question. Who had... A hit UK album was born to do it in the 2000s. A. Coldplay. B. Top Loader. C. A1. Or D. Craig David. Okay. For those of you at home, the correct answer is Craig David. I think it's A1. But it could also be Top Loader, which is also a barrel on a gun. <laughs> which I've never heard Craig David before. I might have to use my last lifeline. 50-50. All right, computer, take away two wrong answers, leaving one remaining right answer and one remaining wrong answer. Right, okay, that hasn't helped you at all, actually. I think I'll go A1. I cannot influence your judgment at all. I'll go A1. <coughs> Final answer? No. Craig David? <laughs> or A1? <laughs> Do you know, when I guess practicing at home, I'm wrong 80% of the time, so I think I'll go for Craig David. I never heard of him a moment ago. Have you ever seen anyone play like that? To be so convinced of one answer, then switch to another? No, never. It was weird. You never heard of him a moment ago. You said, D, Craig David. That is the correct answer! Come on. Never heard of him a moment ago, but now for the Baron Hausman question for half a million. Baron Hausman was known for planning what city? Athens, Paris, Berlin, or Rome? Ingram, I think it's Berlin. Chris Tarrant, take as long as you need. Rome, Paris, Cough. <coughs> Berlin, Athens. It should be pointed out that Berlin is the wrong answer. I'm sure it's Berlin. Another cough, and then the word no. <coughs> No! Objection! Sustain! We once again assert that the audio presented here does not represent the same conditions in which my client is expected to have heard. Just from the transcript then, which speak greater volumes, Ingram, I have to rethink. I don't think it's Athens, and I'm sure it's not Rome. There's a chance it's Paris. <coughs> Another cough. Ingram, it could be Paris. And then, reverting to mic number nine, Diane Ingram's mic, which she possibly forgot about. Oh God, no! Oh, oh God, no. Was that because the plan had to be to stop earlier? To avoid the attention, the larger the prize? Was it all getting out of control? Objection! This is all conjecture. Might we stick to the facts? Gosh. Laughter from the audience. Gosh. Are you sure? You don't have to play. You stand to lose 218,000 pounds. I think it's Paris. Final answer. You said Berlin. 
Berlin, Berlin, Berlin. You changed your answer to Paris. That is the correct answer! Oh my goodness! Paul, it's David. I think it's happening. Something's happening. It's the rollover contestant from last time. We think he's cheating. What? How? I don't know, but we should stop the show. You can't just accuse someone of cheating, David. You have to give him the benefit of doubt until you have proof. Look, normal people don't behave this way. All right! I'll come down. <laughs> so, and I don't get to say this very often, but for one million pounds! The number one followed by a hundred zeros is known by what name? A. Google. B. Negatron. C. Nanomol. Or D. Gigatron. The answer is Google. 20 seconds later of silence. Then Ingram. Let's see. Giga, Nano, Diana from the audience whispered, Oh God, don't start. Tequin Whittock in seat three to contestant two whispers, Do you know the answer? Contestant two whispers back on his mic, Yes, it's Google. Whittock whispers to contestant two, Yes, that's what I thought. And then Ingram, Google, Google, Google. <clears throat> I mean, by process of elimination, I actually think it's a Google. I mean, it's the only chance I'll ever have of winning a million, but it's a heck of a chance. And I don't mind taking the odd risk now and again. Chris, my strategy has worked so far. I'm going to play. The audience gasps. Ingram, I'm going to play Google. Tarrant, final answer? Final answer? Final answer. You have just won a million pounds! Ignore the sound, ignore the glitter. This is theft, this is robbery, and they must be charged! Thank you, Your Honor. The prosecution rests its case. Members of the jury, using the keypads in front of you, please vote now. Press A for guilty and B for not guilty. Remember, the decision is truly yours. Your Honor, the jury says guilty! Objection, Your Honor. It is still custom in English common law that any members of a society is innocent until proven guilty. Oh no, that's all we have time for on this show. <laughs> in this country, we do not yet have trial by media or by the mob. Our defendant, the defendant's case will be heard. Join us again for another rollover. <laughs> Order! <coughs> I said order that the pendant can not be hurt. Mr. Ernest Webb. How are you, my dear Ernest? What brings you up to town? Oh, pleasure, pleasure. What else should bring one anywhere? 
Eating as usual, I see, Aldrin. I believe it is customary for one to take some slight refreshments at five o'clock. Where have you been since Thursday? In the country. The country? What on earth do you do down there? <laughs> when one is in the town, one amuses oneself. When one is in the country, one amuses other people. <laughs> it's excessively boring. And who exactly do you amuse? Oh, neighbours, neighbours. Got nice neighbours in your part of Shropshire? Perfectly horrid. Never speak to one of them. How immensely <laughs> must amuse them. Shropshire is your county, is it not? Ah, yes, Shropshire, of course. Hello. Why all these cups, these cucumber sandwiches? Why such reckless extravagance in one so young? Who's coming to tea? Oh, Millie, Aunt Augusta, and Gwendolyn. How perfectly delightful. Yes, but I don't think Aunt Augusta would quite approve of you being here. May I ask why? My dear fellow, the way you flirt with Gwendolyn is perfectly disgraceful. It is almost as disgraceful as the way Gwendolyn flirts with you. I am in love with Gwendolyn. I have come up to town expressly to propose to her. I call that business. And I thought you would come up for pleasure. My dear fellow, how utterly unromantic you are. I don't see anything romantic about a definite proposal. It is all very romantic to be in love. There's nothing romantic about a definite proposal. When I get married, I'll certainly try to forget that fact. Oh, I have no doubt about that, my dear Algy. The divorce court was specially invented for people whose minds are so curiously constituted. Oh, there is no use speculating on that subject. Divorces are made in heaven. Please don't touch the cucumber sandwiches. They're specially ordered for Aunt Augusta and Gwendolyn. Well, you have been eating them all this time. That's a very different matter. She is my aunt. Have some bread and butter. The bread and butter is for Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn is devoted to bread and butter. And very good bread and butter it is too. Well, you need not eat it if you're going to eat it all. You act as if you're already married to her. You are not already married to her, and I don't think you'll ever will be. Why on earth do you say that? My dear fellow, girls never marry the men they flirt with. Girls don't think it's right. That is nonsense. It is not. It is a great truth. It accounts for the extraordinary number of bachelors that one sees all over the place. Now, on the second hand, I don't give my consent. <laughs> Your <laughs> consent? My dear fellow, Gwendolyn is my first cousin, and before I allow you to marry her, I'd like to clear up this whole question of Cecily. <coughs> Cecily? What on earth do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean, Algy, by Cecily? I know no one of the name of Cecily. Bring me the cigarette case, Mr. Worthing. Left in the smoking room the last time he died to her. Yes, sir. Do you mean to tell me you've had my cigarette case all this time? I wish to goodness you would have let me know. I've been writing frantic letters to Scotland Yard about it and was very nearly offering a large reward. Well, I wish you would have. I have to be more than usually hard up. Well, there is no use offering a large reward now the thing is found. Algy, I think it's quite mean of you. No matter, I look at the inscription inside and find the thing isn't yours after all. Of course it's mine. You see me with it a hundred times and you have no right whatsoever to read what is written inside. It's a very ungentlemanly thing to read a private cigarette case. I have a hard and fast rule about what one should and shouldn't read. Half of modern culture is based on what one shouldn't read. I'm quite aware of that fact, and I don't propose to discuss modern culture. I simply want my cigarette case yes, back. but this isn't your cigarette case, is it? This cigarette case belongs to someone of the name of Cecily. And you said you don't know anyone of that name. Want to know? Cecily happens to be my aunt. Your aunt? <laughs> yes, charming old lady she is too. Lives up at Tombridge Wells. Just give it back to me. Yes, but why did your aunt call herself Little Cecily? From Little Cecily with her fondest love to her dear Uncle Jack. There's no objection, I admit, to an aunt being a tall aunt or a small aunt, but an aunt, no matter what her size may be. My dear fellow, what on earth is that in there? Some aunts are tall, some aunts are not tall. For heaven's sake, give me back my cigarette case. Yes. Why did your aunt call herself Little Cecily if she is your uncle? From Little Cecily, with a fondest love to her dear Uncle Jack, there's no objection I admit to an aunt being a tall aunt or a small aunt. An aunt, no matter what her size may be, she called her uncle her nephew. I can't quite understand. Besides, your name isn't Jack at all. It is Ernest. It isn't Ernest. It's Jack. You've always told me your name's Ernest. You look as if your name was Ernest. You're the most earnest looking person I've ever seen in my whole life. That was perfectly absurd. And if you ever tried to deny the fact to me, or to Gwendolyn, or to anyone else. My name is Ernest, in the town, and Jack in the country. And that cigarette case was given to me in the country. <sighs> yes, 
what I've given into the country. Now go on. I may mention, I've always suspected you of being a secret and confirmed bumbrist. Bumbrist? What on earth do you mean by bumbrist? <laughs> My dear fellow, I'll explain you the meaning of that incomparable expression when you tell me why your name is Jack in the country and Ernest in town. First, produce my cigarette case. Here it is, and I pray your explanation may be improbable. There is nothing improbable about my explanation. In fact, it's entirely ordinary. Old Mr. Com Thomas Cardew, who adopted me when I was a little boy, made me, in his will, guardian, to his granddaughter, Miss Cecily Cardew. Cecily, who addresses me as her uncle. For motives of respect you could not possibly appreciate, she lives at my place in the country under the Admiral Governess, Miss Prism. Where is that place in the country, by the way? <laughs> that is nothing to you, dear boy. You are not going to be invited. <laughs> I may tell you candidly, the place is not in Shropshire. I suspect that. I've bumbers all over Shropshire on two separate occasions. Now, go on. Why is your name Jack in the country and Ernest in the town? My dear fellow, I don't know whether you'll be able to understand my real motives. You're hardly serious enough. When one is placed in a position of guardian, one has to adopt a very high moral tone to all one's subjects. It's one's duty to do so. And as a high moral tone can hardly be said to can do to one's health or to one's happiness, I've had to pretend to have a younger brother of the name of Ernest, who lives in the Albany, who gets into the most dreadful scrapes. That, my dear Algy, is the truth, pure and simple. The truth is rarely pure and never simple. Modern life would be very tedious if it was either and modern literature would be a complete impossibility. That wouldn't be all a bad thing. Thank you very much for your patience. Um, I thought that was fix. I'm allowed to say so. I thought it was an extraordinary 11 plays, and all of you did the very best, gave the very best performances that you have done, and I've seen over the last three and a half weeks of your preparation for this. And you haven't had a big round of applause yet, so all of us, can we just give a huge round of applause? I what uh, Mr. Lawson just said. I mean, thank you for treating me to a brilliant night of theatre. of a great range of different genres and styles. It's been incredible, and it's been a very difficult task. So thank you very much. I want you to all be very proud of yourselves. So let's just go through the, the order and just say a few nice things about all of you, because you all deserve to hear a million, million, million things of praise. Starting with Littleton, with Under Milkwood. Brilliant physicality, real dream-like <coughs> qualities, the whole piece of thought. Uh, narration is one of those things which is um, deceptively very difficult to get right. And it's very easy to look like you're reading from a book, but I thought there was a lovely, um, you could see in your mind's eyes, you could see what you were describing, and I felt like I was there in the town, and I thought it was really, really well done. A lovely tableau in the back of all the actors, I thought it was pretty well staged and really well performed by everyone involved. Moving on to Sparkle Sharp from Mary Windsor, lovely energy to begin with. Um, a really good job, a difficult um, subject matter, trying to you know, invent a story to not be tortured is not something we often do in our day-to-day -day lives. <laughs> but it was a really good job, I thought, making the story seem like it was being made up on the spot, which is difficult to do when obviously you know your lines, or hopefully you know your lines. Um, but it still felt very fresh, like you could see in your mind, you were ticking away, oh, what can we say now, what can we say now? 
and there's really good physicality, especially with the burying scene, I thought, really, really well done. Uh, Lupton House for the front page. A very difficult place here. I think it's got to be very quick, a lot of energy, because especially in that Chicago accent, which I thought were very well done by all the boys, it's very fast moving. So you've got to make sure you hit your marks and that you did it all very, very well. When other people were talking, all of you were doing really good acting in the background to keep the scene feeling alive, which sometimes, and believe me, I've seen a lot of theatre at university now, people don't tend to do. So I thought it was really, really good. Um, and it helped kids see him going. Again, great accents as well, I thought. Uh, Oakley House at Liberty. Again, really good accents again. I mean, you've all been taught very well, apparently. Um, good physical, I think, from the start. There was good physicality of the relationship between um, the mother and Gloria. You could see, even before you spoke, and you could see what the relationship was. And I think as it went on, it built on that. There was good sassiness from both of you. Uh, some good comedic timing. And all in all, a really nice piece, a really lovely little two-hander up. And then Otterley Hill's house, the death of Jude Hill. Again, really good opening energy. From the moment you guys came on stage, it was two great opposing personalities um, clashing, which makes a really good um, theatre. Really good characterisation from everyone, uh, especially when everyone was uh, down stage right in the little tableau when they were on the um, walkie-talkie. I thought that was lovely. And a nice um, eerie ending, I thought. Really nice. And then moving on to Red uh, by Wend from Wendy Gordon. Really fast paced, really great energy. I really liked the um, synchronised moves across the front. Um, the interjections were really well paced, I thought. No one was really cutting over each other, which is difficult to get with such little bits of rehearsal. Great ensemble performance in general. And then Hazeldean with Our Town, really nice, charming little play this, I thought. Um, nice childlike wonder, have you seen? A lot of good snapping in from talking about the scene to being in the scene, and not looking at someone who's not in the scene yet, which is, again, very difficult to do. And you can often catch people looking at someone who's not technically in the scene. But it was good, the fourth wall was very good, and then it was broken and built back up again really well, I thought. And then for the people at the back of the... Um, the back of the stage, really nice dreamlike presence in the back, which added to this kind of, made it seem a lot more vast, I thought, the town, like it was going on for miles. Uh, Walter's House, really good, fun little pieces. I used to watch, I still am a barman, and I felt like I've had that conversation about a million times <laughs> over the years with various regulars. So that was really enjoyable. Lovely pauses, um, difficult to get right because you want them to be awkward, but not too awkward. You think you've forgotten your lines, and I thought you guys timed this really, really well. Uh, brilliant job making such an inane conversation entertaining. Um, uh, Thomas Cook's A Blood Wedding, a lovely opening tableau with um, the Weavers. Great energy, really eerie, the Weavers downstage, especially when you've all moved over this side. Um, was really uncomfortable to watch in the nicest way possible. Um, great phys like, physicalizations with the thread. You really seem like they were kind of living, moving organisms and not just bits of thread, which is really, really impressively done. And a nice ritual feeling, which is uh, what the play is. And uh, the ending was really, really well done, I thought. Uh, Elmser's House with Quiz. Lovely changes of pace. <coughs> Especially during the cough, <laughs> purpose the cough. <laughs> uh, good change of space, especially after the coughing. It was really nice. The little, uh, interjections from the QCs at top worked well, especially when the um, transcript was being read out and it was people were adjusting it in between. Oh, he said this, he coughed, he did this. Brilliantly done. Great physicality, I thought, from the judge and the QCs in the back, up top, looming over. I thought it was really, really, really well staged. And last but not least, Schoolhouse, with the importance of being earnest. A lovely air of snootiness, I thought. A nice kind of barbed back and forth, which was kind of vaguely nice, but you could see some real nasty intentions underneath. A lovely change in pace when, um, when Alex thought he had Ethan caught in his trap of lies and in trying to fight his way and claw his way out of it. Um, really nice, again, a really nice um, three-hander. Uh, now, I'd like okay. to yes. oh. so, just before we continue, so brilliant, that's fantastic. Headmaster, <coughs> would you like to come to the stage to give out the certificates? <laughs> Explain what you've done. 
so I. <laughs> um, what is in? What is in? Yeah, just who it is and why. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Brief. So first award is for runner-up best actor. I thought this uh, character had a great physicality, a really good accent, and really brought a life to a play which is full of life, and that goes to Ben Hilton. goes to someone who I thought brought a brilliant physicality again, played someone much older than them, brought a lovely great deal of caring and a great deal of sassiness to the character, uh, and was just a brilliant mother. I wish my mother was more like that. That goes to SNM Adon. <laughs> Special Adjudicators Award, but I forced uh, Miss Norton to give me two because there's too many people to choose from. <laughs> so, for the first Special Adjudicators Award, for the best Chris Tarrant impression I've seen all year, it goes to Bertie Chandler. Second adjudicator's award goes to Walters for a brilliant double act. to a really good bit of new writing, I thought, with a lot of energy, a really nice ensemble piece, and it goes to Brendan Gordon for Red. Best play goes for one which I thought both looked unbelievably well, looked unbelievable, was staged incredibly well, had some brilliant acting performances in it. It goes to Thomas Cooks for Blood. <laughs> Chris Tarrant impersonator is just going to give a vote of thanks on behalf of all the performers. performers at, uh, tonight. Thank you. So, um, I'd like to say a few, a few quick thank yous um, to uh, everyone who's helped out today. So, first to uh, Mr. Rossbrook for coming back to uh, his old school for the house drama. Uh, we really appreciate it. So. Um, 
We hope you uh, have a good future. So um, here's a token of our appreciation. <laughs> Uh, for the costumes and everything she did behind the scenes. It was really helpful and, uh, yeah, uh, thank you. We'd also like to thank Mr. Proxon and Mr. Jude for everything they've done behind the scenes. Uh, without them, uh, nothing that you see here would be possible. So, um, thank you. Mr. Norton, who, has, with his genius and patience, has helped us through everything. So, thank you, Mr. Norton. Thank you to all the cast and all the audience for coming tonight. Have a good evening.